Today, I'd like to start things off by uh, sharing a story, well, some insights with you about power, and specifically how power uses culture in many ways to achieve its aims. Um, in order to tell this story, I need to um, generate some metaphors. So I'm going to use two metaphors to tell you this story. The first metaphor is the self-help industry itself. And I think we can use this metaphor um, or analogy for other top-down um, popular culture institutions. The second metaphor is the thin self. And the thin self is a concept that my colleagues, Dr. Nearing, Dr. Alvarado, and Dr. Hendricks have used in our research into the self-help industry and its implications for political and social change. Now, who of you has ever read a self-help book? I'd imagine quite a few of us have read self-help books, right? And we're familiar with uh, their content if we haven't read them. Um, I can still remember the first self-help book I ever read, um, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And to reveal my age a little bit, that was like 21 years ago. Um, and I still carry some of those empowering messages today in my life. What are some characteristics of the self-help industry and its sort of products? Well, I want to suggest that the self-help industry is culturally heterogeneous. It's very diverse. So when you're thinking about the range of topics that self-help books cover, you know, you, you, you get a real breadth. You get things like business, um, management, um, sexuality, religion, family, how-to guides. There's a real breadth of topics. On top of that, I'd also say that the narrative form of self-help books is very kind of wide-ranging. So you get parables, you get um, cartoons, you get myths, you get autobiographies. There's a wide breadth of different types of narrative forms. <clears throat> the third thing that I think we could also say about self-help books is that the genre blurs between other genres. So for instance, philosophical ethics, or religious ethics, or how-to guides, again, it's very hard to tell these apart from self-help guides. And the fourth characteristic is that self-help travels. And by that, I mean that self-help is a product, a consumer product that is produced in generally in um, the societies of Northwest, um, the global Northwest, so United States of America, Canada, Europe. And these products, they travel around the world, and they you know, arrive in different cultures. For example, they will arrive in Trinidad and Tobago. And while they're not quite like a, a Trojan horse where all these ideas pile out and suddenly try to take over the society, there is a kind of... Um, meeting, a hybridity, where when they arrive, they'll often meet cultures of self-help that have existed within local cultures for a long time. So, for example, in Trinidad and Tobago, for you know, over 200 years, we've had self-help cultures of Susu and Gaya. But you know, they're, they're not identical to the sort of messages that self-help is bombarding at us. So I want to suggest that self-help, along these lines, is culturally heterogeneous. Now, the second thing I want to sort of suggest to you is what is the message of these self-help books? As I've come to understand it as a researcher and also as a you know, personal reader, the, the message is empowerment through positive psychology, um, empowerment of the self, you know, through such things as self-determination, self-reflection, self-critique, self-branding. It's almost as if you reprogram your mind, your cognitive abilities, the self. You can have a very happy and fulfilling life. You can, you know, achieve money. You can have a great career. Um, you know, you can be a complete success. Um, even have social mobility. Now. Oprah Winfrey, um, Bear Grylls, um, T.D. Jakes, these are good examples of that sort of, of, of genre, of those sort of gurus, of those sort of prophets of self-help. And they're very good at what they do because they give you lots of examples of how they change this mental attitude or they change this idea about their life. They, they went inward and they reprogrammed something about their life and they were successful. And, you know, they, because they offer examples, it's a very believable thing. And I would like to suggest that many of the examples you, they use are the exceptions to the rule rather than the rule itself. And another thing that I think is worth bearing in mind is these, this reprogramming, this self-help. In many ways, it produces an image of a self that is desocialized, disconnected from history and the social, almost as if your life is what you make it, which is, of course, a, a very attractive idea. So my message here is that I think the message of self-help, while the products are culturally heterogeneous, the message within them is very homogeneous. It's a, very, a political ideology that is very um, homogeneous across the different um, the different kind of uh, texts. 
Now, a third thing I want to offer is what is the backstory to self-help? I think this is an important question, something that anthropologists are always interested in. Context, backstory, where do things come from? And there's many different strands to this story. We could think about um, the earliest writers from the 19th century, the self-help writers from the 19th century, or their religious forefathers. And it, it obviously was very much men in those days. But, you know, because I don't have much time, let's just leap forward to the 1980s and think about self-help um, genesis from that point forward. Now, many authors will suggest that, and, and my work suggests this too, that self-help is one element of a much larger happiness industry. And I think many of us have kind of had experiences of the happiness industry. The happiness industry is such things like the If Happiness campaign from NGC last year, or positive psychology, um, or e economists asking for a, a national happiness index, um, other sorts of ideas like sort of mindfulness, resilience, and Prozac are sort of amendments to the, to the working world. And according to William Davis, who's at Goldsmiths, my University of London, and Samuel Bentley at uh, Emerson, the happiness industry is a reaction to something. It's a, it's, it's a device that was designed by a triad of governments, um, academics, and private industry when they realized in the 1980s that there was a massive surge in the global northwest of people being very unhappy at work, who had very low self-esteem. And one of the things about unhappy workers with low self-esteem is they have low productivity levels. And when you have low productivity levels, profits suffer. Right? So private industry, academics, and governments came together in a way to try to make the average worker a little bit more resilient at work. But one of the problems that they, could, they couldn't really deal with is a lot of people were very unhappy at work because the type of jobs they have, you know, a dead-end job, a job that doesn't really give them pride or dignity. Right? You know, a job where you might spend most of the day on Facebook or Twitter. Right? Um, <laughs> a, a job that you know, isn't really needed in the economy. It's really there just to keep people employed. You know, you could make the illusion that CPEP and OJTs are a little bit similar. So what we know is that the self-help industry produces these culturally heterogeneous products, which generally have a sort of political ideology that's very homogenous, and their backstory is a sort of group, a small group of people in some um, rooms in you know, North, Northern Europe and, and, and America, trying to reshape the masses so they're more resilient workers. <laughs> um, this all sounds a little bit like Dr. Evil sitting in the room trying to overtake the world with happiness, right? Um, and, and, and of course, what is wrong with trying to improve yourself? Who doesn't want to improve themselves? Now, the thing about, um, the thing about power is it offers you things that you think you want. It doesn't just punch you in the nose and oppress you, right? It will give you things that you, you feel that you need. So we all want to be better people, right? We all want to empower ourselves. We want to have better lives. So we'll buy into that idea. But when you buy into that idea, culture can also get on your inside and reprogram you. So I think a lot of people might think, well, what's he talking about? Why would it be bad to empower myself? Well, one thing I want to suggest is the thin self. What is the thin self? The thin self is a metaphor for the type of self that positive psychology produces. It's a desocialized and atomized self. A little bit like, you know, the facade of a spaghetti western. You look at the front, you think, oh, yeah, it's a building, and then you get behind, there's nothing actually there. It's a self that's disconnected from history, from things like gender, race, um, class, you know, um, ethnicity, from these things that make the playing field unlevel. You know, self-help is producing this idea that we all kind of can make our lives what we want and the playing field is level for all. But I want to suggest that that's not actually true. So this thin self is really a reprogrammed person who fits these sort of jobs that aren't necessarily needed. It's, 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 it's about making people more resilient without actually changing the system. We don't need to change the system if we change the individuals. And, you know, that's slightly problematic. So I'm saying that self-help turns us inward, and political and social change is about collectivism. So if we're all concentrating on the individual, how do we look out and join together for political and social change? Now, another problem with the thin self 
is if we're only working on fixing ourselves as individuals, how do we deal with the problems of crime? How do we deal with the problems of ecological degradation? How do we deal with the problems of inequality? How do we deal with the problems of alienation? Those are all systematic and structural problems. They're not going to be changed because you have a positive mental attitude. And this is the, the, the crux of the matter. The thin self is a self that's more attuned to survive in the system. It's turned inward, and it doesn't look outward. But wait, you might say. <laughs> I ride my bike to work. I recycle. I'm doing things that you know, make a difference in the world. These are individual things. And I think that intuition is pretty good. I think you know, there's a lot to be said for that intuition. It is important that you, know, you try to make a better world by doing little individual things. But wouldn't it make more sense if that idea that you like from the self-help book, if you turned it outward to other people and then went and shared it with other people, rather than just empowering yourself, share it with other people and maybe even make that idea better? Or for example, the recycling. Um, um, situation. It's great when any of us become recyclers. I, I, you know, I couldn't say that enough. But wouldn't it be more important to not just you recycle, but to get everybody to recycle? Isn't that the point? So what I would suggest is, by turning inward, we lose these opportunities to actually change the system. We perfect ourselves and empower ourselves, but do nothing to really affect the larger structure. We just become more resilient and better fits to work within it. So. In many ways, the message I want to take away, for you to take away from my little talk today about power is that it's not necessarily wrong to read self-help or, or positive psychology. Those are important things. I think we all have a responsibility to make ourselves better people. But we can't just stop there. Right? We need to turn, a bit like in the, the picture here, if we're empowering ourselves, we need to also sort of turn to other people, empower them you know, at the same time. So the issue is here that every day we are bombarded with top-down messages from a variety of cultural industries that are not interested in making the world fairer for all and better for everybody. They're more interested in maintaining profits for certain vested interests. And they bombard us with messages to make us more resilient and to improve our lives. The self-help literature, sorry. Bombards us with messages to improve our lives. And we take them on and we feel a difference and we feel better about ourselves. But again, if we turn inward, we miss all those human things that exist outside of ourselves, like love, cooperation, transformation, social change, political change. All we're becoming is better fits for the system. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that when we get these messages and we feel that they're empowering to us, we have to, if we're going to really fight this sort of top-down, everyday bombardment that we get, all these messages, we're really going to have to turn our empowerment, our power that we take back, rather, outward. And that way, we not only get power for ourselves, but we empower other people as well. Thank you very much.